My name is Lucas Owen. I uncover the most cutting edge health information on the planet, ranging from hormones, nutrition, supplementation, fat loss, biohacking, longevity, wellness, and a whole lot more. Welcome to the Boost Your Biology podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Boost Your Biology podcast. Today's special guest helps purpose-driven men master their energy and become legendary leaders. Evan Mayer, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So maybe, Evan, I always like to start out with um, getting to know my guests a little bit better. Maybe do you want to share with my audience a little bit about your journey and how you got into uh, men's leadership and, and the health optimization Sure. Yeah. So like many people, uh, my avenue into all of this was through a crisis and fortunate. It was when I was pretty young, uh, just got on the, you know, I'll, I'll take a very long story and try to condense it to just a few minutes, but you know, late teens, just not on a good path, getting into drugs and alcohol, dropped out of school, all that kind of stuff. Just getting up to no good. Just being a boy. Ultimately, when I reflect on it now, it's like just, just being a man, finding my, pushing my limits as a boy, you know, trying to, figure out what being a man means and, and kind of pushing back against society as we often do. Uh, anyway, got myself in a heap of trouble and, uh, and really ha started having issues uh, almost like psychologically and, and health wise when I was quite young. And I think it was just because I was just abusing the shit out of my body. Uh, and so that really put me on uh, a path of healing. I was prescribed like many people, especially over here in the West, uh, antidepressants, anti-anxiety, sleeping medication, all these kind of things to alleviate what was anxiety and depression at the time. I was smart enough to know at that age that that wasn't the path that I wanted to go down, prescription medications for my whole life, because where does that end, right? Where do pharmaceuticals end? It's, a, it's not a train you want to get on when you're 18, 19 years old. Uh, so long story short, started getting into alternative healing. What, what would You probably wouldn't deem it as alternative, but what mainstream <laughs> might call it alternative. Uh, looking at supplementation, started doing yoga, uh, and started, you know, meditating and doing mindfulness. And this was, this was before it was a super trendy, probably like 2004, 2005. Um, and, and that kind of just naturally led me down that path. You know, it's kind of like jumping down the rabbit hole or whatever, you know, when you start getting on this stuff, getting into health, getting into optimization, getting into all that, and you really start feeling better. You just want more and more. And then, when I was 26 years old, I had been living in South America. I had started working with plant medicines down there. That's not why I went down there, but that kind of just came across my path. Started working with ayahuasca, started working with psychedelics and stuff like that. And that just really opened my mind to some so some pretty big revelations. And my my path kind of took a, a bifurcation there, right? I really started doubling down on all this kind of holistic healing, health, all that kind of stuff. And I got back to Canada. I'm originally from Canada and I was in, I entered this relationship and I recognized that I was with this woman that I just could not figure out. Like I, she was like this Rubik's cube that I just, I didn't know how to relate to her. I didn't know how to hold her. I didn't know how to lead her all this. I didn't even have this language at that time. And I was really struggling. And, and upon reflection, I recognized that I had been struggling in a relationship my whole life, especially with women, but also with, with other men. Like I, I, I had men in my life, but I always felt like weird. And especially since I was into all this healing stuff and, you know, this alternative kind of stuff, I felt like an outsider a bit. And my roommate at the time, who was a woman, gave me a book called Way of the Superior Man by David Data. <laughs> you may be familiar with that book. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, and I read that book cover to cover in like two days. And, uh, it blew my mind. Like, it was just like, what? There was all this information there. It was perfectly resonant with where I was at in my life in terms of, I didn't feel like I had a purpose. I was just working random construction jobs and stuff like that. My relationship was in tatters and this woman wanted all these things for me that I didn't know how to give her. Uh, I didn't have good brothers in my life. And so long story short, one of the chapters in that book says, go find a men's group. So I did that. I, I followed all the rules, all the suggestions to that book to a T. I went and found a men's group, a local men's group. They started showing me uh, some practices uh, and some basically initiated me into this, this level of brotherhood that I had never experienced before. 
And that just led me on a journey. As soon as I got a taste of that, I just went all the way in. I ended up working with a, a teacher very closely out of California named John Wineland. He's pretty, pretty big in the men's group world or men's work world over here in the U.S. And I worked side by side with him for six years. And um, it just it went from I was a bi- I was a biodynamic farmer at the time. I was kind of doing all sorts of different things, but food and farming and all that kind of stuff, super into holistic health and all that was really important to me. And I thought that's what that was what I was going to do for the rest of my life. I was thought like, this is what I'm doing. Uh, and, and I ended up getting invited to start leading men's groups and teaching at workshops and everything just kind of expanded organically to where I am today. Uh, about six years later, uh, leading men's groups full time, coaching men and uh, just imparting some of those, those things that I've picked up along the way in my life experience. And then from all the different teachers and influences that I've had, that's kind of a consolidated condensed version of the story, <laughs> but that, that's where it got me today. Yeah. Incredible stuff, man. I mean, as you brought up uh, the way of the superior man, uh, my best friend during my university studies, he actually first handed me that book and that blew my mind as well. And it changed my perspective of what it really means to be a man. So I can relate to you there. But in terms of, I mean, when you first did that workshop, like when you first surrounded yourself with other men looking to you know, become better versions of themselves and just imp- with that self-improvement mindset, like what were some of the big things that came up for you during those sessions? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, the first thing was I, I got around men that were playing at a level that I had never, like I'd never <laughs> been around that caliber of men, right? Like the, it's not often that you meet men who are spending good money and time and energy and travel just to get around it's like people that are really playing at a higher level. And so that alone, it's like, the, mm. it's so often beat to death, but you know, the, you're the average of the five people you're around with. I really experienced that, that when I got around these men, just being in the space of guys that were running seven, eight figure businesses that were best selling authors that were doing big things in the world, professional athletes, all this kind of stuff. I was like, wow, the potential in this room, these guys aren't that much different than me, right? Mm. There may be a few steps ahead, but they're no different than me. They're just as, as messed up as me in some ways and just struggling just as much in relationship or whatever this, that, and the other. So that alone was massive. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for getting around that caliber of men, but what it really gave access to, uh, well, let me just back up a bit. I work specifically in the realm of embodiment. So I, when you say men's group, this isn't a guy, a guy sitting in a circle and just talking about their problems. And, you know, that's a part of it, but it's a small part of it. The bigger part of it is how do we actually recalibrate our nervous system, right? How do we start to unwind some of the societal patterning or some things that happened to us when we were younger or, or some of the conditioning that we picked up? Because everything that we, our personality, we were trained into essentially. We were, we were born into the world the, pretty much a blank slate. And we picked up all this conditioning stuff, depending on our family and our childhood and, you know, the school we went to and our educators and stuff like that. So getting in a group like this with the practices and the, and the, and the container that they created allowed me to start to really look at this stuff and unwind it. Like, okay, well, what a part of my conditioning is having me come into the same problems in relationship over and over again, or why do I feel guarded around other men or hyper competitive right? Which has its uses, but also keeps your heart closed from authentic connection and brotherhood, right? And all these types of things I started to look at. And I, and I recognized that I had been spending so much of my life uh, constricted, if you know what I mean, like I was protecting, protecting myself from other men, protecting myself from getting hurt in relationship. And what happens is when you put men in an intentional container together and, they're, and they want to be there, you can start to have access to a level of uh, vulnerability, a level of honesty, and a level of camaraderie that is not available anywhere else in society, right? And so the difference between men and women is like women will get together and naturally talk about things and their problems and stuff going on in their life. Like that's what they want to do. Men need a very special, specific container oftentimes unless they've done a lot of work on themselves to even begin to open up to these things, right? Men will often sit in silence around a fire together, maybe just grunting and crushing a beer or, or they want to go do something. They want to go on a hike or fix a car engine or whatever it is. You know what I mean? These kind of classic ideas where guys don't really actually have to be in direct contact with each other. They have like something that they're working through or around or on collectively. And so 
when you create intentional spaces where men can actually just be with each other and this stuff starts to emerge and there's a lot of vulnerability there, a lot of healing happens. Um, and also these groups, when you get around men, you trust because of that vulnerability, because of that camaraderie, you start to give each other honesty, honest feedback. And that's something that, you know, David data talks a lot about, and that's something that men really need. So these groups offered me as well. And I know I'm giving you a lot here, but they offered me the opportunity to get honest feedback. That wasn't to cut me down. It wasn't to, it wasn't criticism, but it was like, Hey bro, like I want the best out of you because I love you. And this is what I see you need to work on. You know what I mean? And, and, and getting that from men that you trust amplifies your life 10 X immediately. So those are a couple of things that I received from them. There's so much, but yeah, you know, I'll start that's there. incredible. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Cause it, it also reminds me of a, like a men's health group that I got involved in two, three years ago. And I remember just the weight off my shoulders after the first mm -hmm. session, just by being able to have a space to actually openly communicate things that were causing me a little bit of distress around like relationships. And the one theme that kept on popping up for me at least, and this is something that I'm sure you've seen with a number of other men is like, um, feeling like they have difficulty transitioning out of work mode into like connecting with their partner, romantic mm -hmm. space. Like, did you want to sort of elaborate on that? Like if you've come across that or you've, you've seen that a common theme emerge. Yeah. Are you, are you familiar? Have you ever heard of Alison Armstrong or have you ever heard of any of her work? Uh, it rings a bell. Rings a bell. <laughs> okay. So she, th this is perfect. Cause she's got a great piece around this that I love bringing into the men that I work with. Um, that transition time is a very sacred time between work and between being available for family or our partners or anything else that's basically not work, right? Um, mm. Because we have this, she, she defines them as kind of the men are hunter, the women are gatherers generally, right? And so when we're in hunter mode, we're directional, we're assertive, we might just blow by our woman without even noticing she's existing because it's like, I'm just in go mode right now. <laughs> I have a mission. I know what I need to do, whatever it is. Uh, and, and you just, you get in that kind of, yeah, it's just one direction. It's almost like a, a tunnel vision, right? And so that's very powerful. Like you want to be able to cultivate that single point of focus in your life. You want to be able to consolidate your energy and laser focus it on one thing because that's how you get stuff done in the world as a man, right? And it's a very good skill to cultivate. However, it doesn't bode well with the rest of our life right? It doesn't, it's, it's hard to be present for people. It's hard to be available. It's hard to be in our hearts when we're in that mode. So the best advice that I heard that comes from Alison Armstrong that I, I am try to live by and impart on other people is to create that space, that transition space. And she, the, the big teaching for her is for women to understand that we need that space, that when I come home, and I come through the door and I'm still holding, let's just hypothetically say like holding the briefcase, right? And I'm still, I'm like still in the, got the tie around my neck or whatever it is that I can't go right into like lover, honey mode, how you doing? Let's help with the kids, blah, blah, blah. That just, it doesn't work in let, until you've built a huge capacity to have that range to turn that on and off. What men need is like that time. It's why men come home oftentimes. And it's so classic. It's like a sitcom. They want to kick up their feet. They want to grab a drink. They want to watch TV, whatever it is, you know, whatever their thing is, or they go hide out in the shop or whatever that thing is that they need for that transition time. That is a sacred time for them to decompress for like letting all that stuff go and then approaching their obligations in their family life when they're ready on their time. Right. So that's a huge distinction versus the desire for people to need things from them because really the world needs things from them all day. So the ultimate masculine like idea of freedom is resting in the, in no demand where the world doesn't need anything from him. So it's very hard to go from being needed all day in your purpose and in your work and everything to go being immediately needed at home by whatever your obligations are, because to a man that feels like a burden, even if it's the best things, even if it's like his wife wanting to love him and his kids wanting to crawl all over him and tell them about their school day and stuff on some level, it's still kind of like he has to do something yeah. like he still has to perform in some way or he has to be present or he has to be there. And so man, a man 
needs to create space throughout his day and throughout his life to be in these spaces of no demand where he's not needed for anything. This is why men have gone to caves for thousands of years and meditated in the Himalayas and gone on dark retreats and all these types of things where, you know, going into the forest where there's no women around and there's no children and they can just rest as consciousness. Yeah. Now that's a really, really relevant discussion because, um, you know, I see a number of men, including myself, just sometimes finding it a bit challenging to transition out of that work mode. And like you said there, like I can be very fierce in my focus. And I guess there's a, sometimes there's a fear of loss of focus. So like I, I fear that Absolutely. I can't then transition back into being able to focus. So that, that mm -hmm. definitely can be, you know, because focus is what has built my business and my company. And being, this is a skill and a, and a trait that I, I value a lot and that it, then there's like a fear of loss of if I get, you know, into that mode as well. That's super common. I, I, I struggle <clears throat> with the same thing even to this day. It's like, hmm. it almost feels like sometimes we're put at choice between focusing on our relationship and focusing on our business and finding that balance in our lives or focusing on, it doesn't even have to be relationship, but the rest of life, essentially, you know what I mean? <laughs> what, whatever other obligation, because when you get in that mode and you're an entrepreneur and you're creating and you're building, like you, it's hard to turn off. Not only do you not mm. really want to turn it off, but it's, it's just like, it's hard. Like you, you, you become obsessive. You, you want to create this. Right. And so what's important is we have to give ourselves that time of no demand, regardless if we're in a relationship or not. And that time where we're not totally immersed in it, because we know that, that that doesn't lead to a good place eventually. You can't sustain that forever, that energetic forever. So there has to be nourishment coming in in our life. And we can receive that nourishment through a lot of ways, but that's what the feminine really gives us. We can't just be 100% in that masculine energy 24 hours a day because it's also just abrasive to other people. It's not fun to be around. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, what about in terms of like – men having this strong desire for needing space and in terms of particularly in relationships. Um, this is something that I've also found that I, when I say I need space, it's not because I don't, you know, want, it's not because I don't love my girlfriend. It's, it's because I need that to then rejuvenate, recover and things of that nature. So maybe do you want to sort of expand upon like the, the desire for men to need space for sure. Yeah. So it's a little bit kind of like what I was speaking at a little earlier. So in and take everything I say with a grain of salt, because this is just what I've learned and what I've experienced and what I've seen in the hundreds of men that I've worked with over the last, you know, five, six years. Innately, our desire, and you may have heard this if you're familiar with David Data's work, but kind of the masculine desire at the very core is freedom right? It's, it's the desire. That's why we really build our businesses. If we really were to take a step back and look at everything in our life, well, I build my business because I want to generate enough money, you know, and, and, and buy back my time so I can have the freedom to do the things that I want, spend it with my family, go on vacations, do whatever I want, right? Buy the things I want. All of that is in conflict with the relational desire from a woman to receive more love, Right. She's always like, I want more love. It's not even that I want your love. I want more love. And even all the love you give me will never be enough because I want more, essentially. And, and you know, we all have those aspects in us. There's a part of us that wants that as well as men. And there's women that also want to feel freedom. But when you get an intimate relationship and when you're ma a man that's really on purpose, you're going to really polarize your woman, right? She's going to be like even wanting more love because you're even more focused on your mission, right? And so that kind of gap grows where there's actually more friction. So the deeper you get into building the life that you want and the more masculine, quote unquote, that you become, the more she's going to get polarized into wanting even more of your attention, which can create a lot of difficulty in relating, which including like I, I struggle with and I go through in my partnership as well. And like you said, man or men in general, the masculine, is rejuvenated in solitude. Not always. You're also around other men, but generally there's a, there has to be some negotiated part of your life where you spend it in solitude because what happens is that we don't take that space 
And then we build up, build up, build up like a pressure valve. And then when we are like, I need space, it comes out in the totally wrong way. And that's on us. And so generally the negotiation isn't about needing more space in our partner, but it's actually how do we bring that consciously to them in a way where we're preemptively creating the space in our lives. So it doesn't get to that point where we just feel totally overwhelmed and need to kind of like eject for a bit and fuck off. Cause that's the part that is like a dagger to our partner. It's not creating the space. It's how we create it and when we create it and what we're negotiating. And I will say to that point that different people, like different configurations of partnership, some are just incompatible. Like I need an incredible amount of space and it's a negotiation. There might, there, that reduces the amount of women that are available to me that are compatible with me in a long-term relationship that can honor the amount of space that I need. Right. And that's just the truth. That's a, it's just a compatibility thing. I, I used to make myself wrong for feeling like I need a lot of space because I thought I was being, she was telling me I was being avoidant, but I'm not being avoidant. I just, that's who I am. I, I, Error on the side of, of the more masculine side of the spectrum, right? Some men are more in the middle where they can get nourished in all types of different ways in relationship. That is in my case. And so to your point, you know, I give you kind of a big answer there, but I would say for men that are struggling with that or resonating with that, the first thing is, is that get honest with yourself, right? Because what honest, what usually happens is that men try to be everything for everyone because they want to be there for their woman. They want to show up for her. They want to show up for their work or whatever they're doing in the world. They want to show up for everything. And then they get overwhelmed and they have those moments where they pop and they eject. Right. And that's on you. That's your responsibility to create your life in a way where you're creating the space to get that nourishment alone. And then having that on honest conversation in relationship where you can say like, Hey, listen, like I need, Every second Saturday, I need to be completely alone, no contact, like phone off, whatever it is, out in nature, or, you know, two hours every, whatever, an hour after work every evening, I just need that space to go do whatever I need to do, sit in the sauna, I don't know, whatever it is to, for you, go for a walk and, and honor that, because it's the same as the transition time, it's the same kind of concept, right? But part of our, in my opinion, part of a man's responsibility especially when it comes to relationships and that's what we're talking about is to create the culture is to, is to lead and create the culture of the relationship. Right. Because I guarantee that any man that feels like his woman is on his ass because he doesn't get any freedom is probably because he's not declaring it in the relationship and leaning it in a way that she can trust where she knows like, okay, yeah, he's taking his two hours this Saturday. I know that it's the thing that we do. And then he's going to come back to me and he's going to be a hundred percent attentive for the rest of the night. Cause he's recharged. Yeah. Yeah. That plays into actually an analogy that I thought of. Well, it's something that occurs with myself, particularly on the weekends I've set up, I would say it's like a boundary or like a rule where like, I don't focus on work as much and I'm, you know, out and enjoying my weekend, you know, being more social, going to hanging out with friends and all that sort of stuff. And then what happens is on the Sunday night, it starts to create this like slingshot effect. And then once mm -hmm. it hits Monday morning, like that slingshot has been pulled back so far by the time it hits Monday morning, like I'm off like a rocket and I'm just like straight into my work, straight into being super productive. But there's a lot of tension that develops in that state though. Like so on a Sunday night, for example, a lot of tension starts to brew inside my body and I'm like, I really need to do work right now. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if you've ever sort of seen guys similar to that. Totally. <laughs> Yeah. And, and that's, I can't count how I'll just talk about myself because I've experienced all these things. Right. So it's the easiest <laughs> thing to talk about. I can't, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've committed to doing something with, whether it's with my partner or, or with my family or with people that like the whole time I'm just not present. Cause I'm thinking about the things that I should be doing at work. And I'm sure that any man <laughs> listening to this can resonate. Right. And so that isn't fair to us and it's not fair to the rest of our lives either. Like our partner's we don't get much out of it because we're not present. They don't get much out of it because they can feel our lack of presence a hundred times more. They're a hundred times more sensitive than we are a thousand times more sensitive yeah. than we are. So any little, like, you know, if she's a highly attuned woman, anytime we should start thinking about work again, she's like, Oh, like, where are you? Where, like, where'd you go? You know what I mean? She might not be saying that, but it's showing up in the way that she's being, or maybe she's uh, nagging us or whatever that is. Right. And so, man, I don't think there's an easy answer. I think that this is a, uh, 
a, a thing that we have to be honest with ourselves in what we're negotiating in our lives. So that's, that's the thing is like, are you really turned off? Are you turned off from work because you said you would be, or can you truly disconnect from work? And that's a really mm. hard thing to do. Right. But if I can negotiate times in my life where I'm, like I said earlier, it's the same thing as taking space. I know that like this time that I've created is specifically created for work and I am going to accomplish as much as I can in that time. And then I'm committed for myself and for the rest of my life that like when I hit enough, it's enough because that compulsion will never go away of thinking about work on the weekends and all. Of course there's, it's the endless to-do list, dude. There's always more to do, but the, but like I said, if we're doing it in the desire to be free at some point, and the to-do list is always growing and never ending, that's a game that you will never get out of. So it could eat up your whole weekends. Even if you put the phone away for a whole day, if the compulsion is there that there's always these things that need to happen and you just double down on the anxiety around it when you pick your phone back up, that's not true freedom, right? So mm. a lot of what I, I, I guide men through is freedom isn't contingent on, you don't have to earn it based on how much you accomplished in a day right? That's not where it comes from. This is an internal game. And when we, now that we live in a world where there's at, so much access to us 24 hours a day, where we could always be checking emails, we could always be working on something, we could always be dialing in our copy and our sales pages and whatever else the fuck that we <laughs> think we need to do. Like it is an art and a practice and a training of the nervous system to be legitimately turned off. And if you have a relationship where you never really fully turn off, that relationship probably won't last. That's just mm. this truth, you know, because a good, a, a person that's sensitive enough, a woman that's sensitive enough, she won't want to tolerate that. She doesn't want to feel like she's second best to your business forever. <clears throat> she can tolerate periods of it, but eventually it's going to totally destroy things. Mm. You brought up a really important um, element of like how men sort of just deem themselves as successful, which is like ultimate freedom. And you sort of mentioned like the money component. Uh, I'd love to hear from you in terms of how your um, perspective on money and freedom has evolved over the years. Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> it's evolved a lot. Um, of course we all, maybe not all of us, but many, many men, especially in their early twenties and even through their thirties, I'm thir I'm 34. So I'm just about in my mid thirties. Money is a huge focus because it feels like the easiest access to the freedom that we want. And what I've learned over having different amounts of money throughout my life, sometimes a lot of money and other times very little money that the quality of my life is absolutely not contingent, nor is the freedom. Uh, because I have more money. There is a certain amount of freedom that it gives you. I would also say there's an immense amount more responsibility that comes with it. And that's what I've learned in the last couple of years is the amount of responsibility that comes with wealth is immense. And if you think that you're going to be more free on the other side of that, I have bad news for you. Um, what I try to, and uh, so many men come to me because they, I want to get on my, you know, I want a purpose in life. It's such a common thing. I want a purpose. I want to make this much money. I want this because then finally I can da, 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 da. It's like the classic story. Finally, I can do this. Finally, I can do that. If I only get the house, if I only make X amount of money a year. But that is a way that, that is a context that you relate to life through. That is not like that's, those aren't true goals. When you relate to money as when you have enough of it, you will get something that never ends. And you know, it never ends because you look at people who are super wealthy and they haven't stopped achieving and they haven't stopped working and they haven't stopped trying to make more money. Almost nobody does. There's not a lot of billionaires that made a billion dollars and then just said, you know, fuck it. Like, I'm just going to chill now. There's a few, I'm sure. But a lot of them are just continually trying to create more because that is coming from a beingness of, of like endless need of growth and consumption. And so that's like a hungry ghost that will never be filled, which is why the freedom that you want to create 
always comes on the inside. It comes through the body. It comes through the nervous system. If you can feel free in a moment when you have an absolute immense amount of pressure in your life and you can access even just an iota of freedom in your body, that's true freedom because it's not based on external circumstances. Mm. Mm. Resonates, resonates so much. I love that perspective shift that's evolved. And I guess uh, as part of that, maybe we should discuss, you know, the need for men to constantly build and, you know, acquire and develop and always grow in that sort of way. I mean, that's something that I've held true to myself in terms of, you know, always wanting more, but then, you know, how often do I pause and reflect and smell the roses to a degree? So I'd imagine that's an area that you see a, a number of men, particularly those that are, like you said, you work with, you know, highly successful entrepreneurs and individuals. I'm curious to know more about like what happens to their mindset once they've reached that like financial goal, um, what, what, what tends to happen with their mindset maybe around further growth and development? Like what are they usually trying to look for or, or seek? Yeah, well, I think priorities shift because when you when you have a belief that when you get to X goal or X amount of money that it's going to shift something in your life and then you get there and it hasn't, that's <laughs> that's a pretty destabilizing experience to have for a lot of people. And oftentimes to get to that place, they make immense sacrifices on things that they recognize maybe they shouldn't have sacrificed, like you know, raising their children if they're fathers or the health of their relationship, or they realize that they're, they've made all the money they ever wanted and built the big company and sold it and they're 40 and they have no friends, right? <laughs> and so they get to these places where they're like, shit, I did the thing and here I am and I actually don't feel good about myself. And now I'm starting to recognize that this was empty and meaningless, right? And so it's interesting because of course, everything that they create in their life got them there to ha to the availability to take on like, the space in their life to look at their life more yeah. judiciously. So it's not all like, of course, that's the path that they had to go on. There's nothing wrong with it. And I've never met a man that like comes to me or works with me and says, I've made this much money. I'm doing this well. And like, all I want to do is make more money. And if they do that very quickly gets deconstructed when we get to under standing why yeah like why and where is it generated from because you you like to post i made a little while ago and i kind of pulled it up from fight club and i said self-improvement is masturbation right <laughs> and and a lot of it is because of this endless striving for a man to be better and i'm fitness money purpose women whatever it is any way they can optimize their life like you're in the you're in the the world of of health optimization right all mm. good and well but there's people that fundamentally, no matter how, what their blood markers say, no matter how optimized they are, no matter how well they're eating, no how much, whatever it is, that genuinely think that they're like always behind the ball. Like they're never healthy enough. They're never X enough. They're never wealthy enough. They're never this enough. That generating your life from that place will, is exhausting. It'll kill you, right? Like, it, 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 so it's not about the making money or, or, you know, you shouldn't make a lot of money or you shouldn't aspire to make a lot of money, but where are you actually generating it from and how are you relating to it? Because like you said, you don't stop to smell the roses. How many men do you know that have access to genuine joy in their life, like genuine celebration where they can just stop and they can slow down and their mind isn't going a million miles an hour and they can go into nature, not because they're, they have to get their five kilometer thing in because they need 15,000 steps, but because like they just want to be out there and enjoying it. There's no place to get to. There's no mountain to conquer, but they can actually, that is that I assume is why men want to make all the money in the first place. So mm. why not come from that place first? Cause you can enjoy the journey and you can enjoy the ride and you can make good money and not sacrifice your relationships and not sacrifice brotherhood and not sacrifice your health. All of that is possible, but we get so one directional. That is the, the shadow side of that masculine directionality is that when we are too much in it and we don't balance it out, 
we become tyrannical. Hmm. What do you have to say about men that somewhat complain about not having a sense of purpose or mission? Um, like, yeah, how do you help men navigate that when they're feeling like they're stuck in a job that they hate and they're not actually living out their true pu uh, purpose? Yeah, I mean, there's a few directions for that. Oftentimes I find men are like waiting for their purpose to fall on their lap or like suddenly <laughs> they'll wake up and they'll have this like great idea and like, oh, that's my purpose. And I, in my experience, it's a, it's more of throwing shit at a wall and seeing what sticks and like trying things. And I've done it. I've been in the dead end, like nine to five jobs that I hated. Uh, and I personally think that you have to be willing to blow your life up. Like you have, if you're really committed to walking a path of what is integral with your heart and your truth and how you really want to be aligned, like fully in this world, like I know this is what I'm here to do and this is how I want to live. You have to be willing to make massive moves in your life and take some big risks. And that's what a lot of men aren't willing to do. It's very hard to be miserable working 40, 50 hours a week and not having the energy to go and seek out other things in your life. Like for me, I was working in tech. I was working for a big tech company. A lot of people would know I was miserable. I was on the computer all day, like just wired into the matrix all day. And I just could not, like I was literally frying my brain. And I had done a bunch of different jobs and I just knew that like, this was not it. And so I just had this inkling and I was in my late twenties. I was just like, I'm just going to go work on a farm. It's something I've always wanted to do. It sounds interesting. I was making like a 10th of what I was making in tech. Like maybe not, like not even, you know what I mean? I had to make massive gambles. I had to give up a lot of my life. And I understand that people have families and, and marriages and things, and they can't just walk away from their life. I can only speak from my own experience though. It's like time and time again, the men that I've seen that really find purpose and commit to it is they're willing to let things go because like, are you really hungry for your purpose? If you're just doing the same shit over and over again and complaining about it, like, what are you willing to shift in your life? What are you willing to explode? What are you willing to completely let go of in order to allow life to offer you something new? Because every time you close the door, a new one opens. If you trust that enough, like I think Terrence McKenna says, you jump off a cliff and you find out that you're, you land on a bed of feathers. Right. So <laughs> it's, it's the willingness to take that risk. What's the worst that can happen? You fail, you go back into whatever you were doing before, but there's no easy answer. And if you really feel like this is David data 101, if you feel like you don't have a purpose or you're not living your purpose, then your number one job in your life is to be looking for your purpose. That should be mm. where all your energy is directed towards. And I often find that it's not, like I said, it's not going to be inscribed on a big stone that you're walking down the street. This is my purpose. It's through trial and error. And it's actually the intersection of things that you are already kind of not only interested in, but kind of good at because things become more interesting when you're good at them. All right. And so mm. I like to do a lot of different things and I fell into this work very organically because I was good at it. I never expected myself to be doing this and leading men and stuff like that. I got invited into it through a bunch of synchronicities. I was good at it and that was really exciting for me. And so I started to cultivate those gifts more and I realized that this is something that's worth doing and it's not about me. That's the thing about purpose too. Don't make it all about you, right? Mm. give a gift to the world where it actually impacts and change lives. That's a real purpose. Not this thing. Like I want to make X money or be a start a social media agency or that's my fucking purpose or whatever this does. Like go do something, start a real fucking business and like impact lives. That'll give you more purpose than anything. If you want a purpose, go feed the homeless at their soup kitchen. That'll like, <laughs> it, it, it will, it, I'm serious. Like, cause it'll inspire you to giving is a really deep purpose in the world. So find some way to give, you know, that's, I can relate to that a lot at the start of my like social media journey, particularly Instagram. My main mission was to just share cutting edge health information that people struggle to find on Google and just do it out of goodwill and good heart. And of course it's still the same today, but my mission back then was just to like, I felt like if I have something to share with the world that can benefit the world, there's no point keeping it to myself. I want to, get it out there and help people because I, 
quickly learn to realize that giving feels better than receiving mm-hmm. and, and, and giving out just has some sort of energetic shift in the body that just, I don't even know how to, <laughs> how to explain it, but yeah, definitely can relate to that element then. And something else that came up with what you were saying there is this aspect of, of life, which is fear. Um, what have been some of the most powerful methods or strategies that you've helped to educate men around overcoming fear? Right. So that's where I would start is even that language of overcoming fear. I don't think that's possible. I think fear. So one of my great teachers, his name's Adam Quine. He shout out Adam. He's been a great teacher to me in my life. And he's one of his principles is he says possibility and fear always come in equal amounts, right? So when there is a huge possibility in our lives to create something epic, to live our purpose, to, you know, uh, meet a woman who just like absolutely blows our mind naturally an equal amount of fear is going to come up with that because we're stepping into the unknown we're doing something new we're we're living at our edge right and so it's not men want to overcome fear and they often conflate that with avoiding their fear or suppressing their fear or dep- or pretending it doesn't exist right like oh like no fear i'm fearless uh, i don't ever trust a man who says he's fearless it's not true. Those guys are usually like you talk to any veteran and they're like, were you scared in, in war? Like, fucking, of course, anyone worth like, you know, <laughs> who's honest is like, yeah, I was terrified. Like it was, it was a really scary experience for me. So what I lead men to do and, and first of all, it's changing the context to working in partnership with your fear because your fear hmm. isn't going anywhere. And it's also a very wise teacher as is every emotion that we feel as is our anger, as is our grief, as is our jealousy, our rage, whatever it is, right? So when we can work in partnership with our fear, then we can actually, we're not stunted by it. We're not trying to push it away, but we can acknowledge it. And what that might look like is feeling it. Like, and that, and that's what I'm, I'm, I'm so about the embodied experience of like, wow, I am feeling so much fear in my body right now, right? What is this fear communicating to me? Or like, how can I work in partnership? Thank you, fear. Now I'm going to go do the thing that I want to do. Because fear and like thrill are not that much different. Like like the anxiety when you're about to go speak publicly or something like that, there's like an excitement about it. Of course, it's terrifying, but it feels good. And that energy is very powerful, right? And so working in partnership with our fear, it's like, wow, I'm standing at the edge of the cliff, right? And and I can acknowledge my fear and take the leap is oftentimes all it takes for men because they, there's some weird belief that you can either get over your fear or that it should feel like there is no fear. If you're doing the right things, it's like, no, 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 no. That's, that's the fucking opposite. My life is terrifying. A lot of the time I'm in fear all the time, not in big fear, but I'm just like, wow, I'm doing something really edgy and putting myself, you know, this, you're putting yourself out into the world. You're, you're, you're creating things that are like from you, you generated them. They're, they're, they're like your essence, putting that stuff out into the world and, and, and putting yourself into the world is innately terrifying. It's unusual, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it's, it's not going anywhere. So once I recognize in myself that my fear is never going to go anywhere. And every time that it comes up, it means there's a massive possibility available for me that it just rewired the way that I approach it. And mm-hmm. it's not that I don't, have moments where I have trepidation or anything like that, nor do any of the men that I work with. But if you can recontextualize that relationship and understand that like men in general, I'll just say are terrified of their emotions. They kind of want to live this emotional list life. Like we don't want to deal with emotions. And all that does is makes our life very, very small because speaking about joy before, if you don't want to be with your fear and you don't want to be with your anxiety or your anger, or your grief, then you don't, Think that you're ever going to be able to be with happiness and joy and all the other things that live on the other side of the spectrum. Do you also think, Evan, that um, men believe that they, you know, it's better off to be more emotionless because they believe that's like emotions can slow them down and like hold? Do you think maybe that might be part of their mindset? For sure. I mean, look at our culture. Like, <laughs> men have been totally 
programmed to be emotionless and we had to be for a lot of existence. If you even look at the hundreds of thousands, a couple hundred thousand years that we've been human, we've been through constant war, killing, hunting. We have to turn off that part of us. It's been, it's traumatic. And mm. there is a cost to that. And that's different for every man. So I'm not saying that you should be hyper emotional or always be in your emotions because there's certain times where it's good to be able to compartmentalize and just get the job done and turn those off for a moment. But if you spend a lifetime turning those off and you don't know how to actually access your emotions, you are, are going to struggle. And I've seen this happen to so many men where they are really good at doing that until about 40. And then they have a complete meltdown. Like they, they have anxiety. They have like depressive episodes. They have all this stuff starts to come up because your body keeps the score. It can only hold on to it for so long. And these are not men who are successful in relationship. And if they have children, they're not very connected with their children because the rest, the, the world is an emotional place and, and children and women are, and, and, and to some other men are, emotional beings and if you can't relate with them because you don't have access to your own emotions you certainly can never understand them their crying will annoy you you know their frustration will piss you off you'll become avoidant all these types of things so you don't have to be with emotion but it's it's certainly not healthy and i also would just say one more point that is not the history of most cultures if you if you study antiquated cultures there was not emotional suppression across the board for men. Men had containers. They had ceremony. They had um, circle. They had in indigenous cultures here. They had sun dances and sweat lodge and things where they were able to move and process emotions with other men, which is all the – this is just the updated work of that basically is modern men's group, right? Mm. But we don't give space for men to do that anymore, and so they – you can see it in their body, the way that men are so contracted and rigid, right? You can see it, how they, they're holding so much tension. And mm. it's just, it's not, I would assert that you're a health dude, like how much that contributes to heart disease and cancer and all those kind of <clears throat> top diseases that we carry in the world are massively influenced by stress. Oh, absolutely. And also as part of that, Evan, would be, the impact of like loneliness, how that's equivalent to smoking like five packs of cigarettes a day. There's a, yeah, hmm. it's insane. A man kills himself every two seconds. Hmm. You know, that's, that's a product of isolation. I would say that's, that's the number one killer of men in terms of psychological like impact on why men commit suicide is that feeling of isolation. It's the, it's created a huge mess in the world. Hmm. And that's why it sort of goes back to what you said earlier on, which was like you are the sum of the five people you hang around most. And that means that like men just need to be honest with themselves and ask themselves like who are, the guy, who, who are your mates? Who are your friends you're hanging out with? Like are they go-getters, achievers? Are they people you, are you're inspired by or are they guys that actually are holding you back or keeping you at a low level? So I think that's a really important element to this and this sense of community and that that element there is really crucial when it comes to maintaining a healthy mindset and you know good mental health. Absolutely. And, and it, like I went through that, you know, I had my, my buddies in college and they were good dudes. They just weren't playing the game that I wanted to play in life. And they're still good dudes and there's nothing wrong with them. And I'm grateful for all the times we had together, but for Beyond that, for most men, the so many of the men I talk to, I ask them, like, do you have a single friend? Like, do you have a single man in your like dude in your life that you hang out with that you can actually confide a little bit deeper than going for a beer or talking about sports or whatever like that? And across the board, 90% of them is a no. That is that is terrifying. That is not a good place to be in. And and it, it doesn't have to be that you have to go get with your boys and like share all this intimate stuff or anything like that. Literally like, yeah, for me, I'm a big nature dude. So I always bring it back to getting outside, but like getting men together and going for a hike, going for a walk, going for a surf, going for a swim, whatever it is, just, just getting together that time bonding, even when you're not speaking, just doing something, ha having a, a 
a challenge together or an activity that you're doing together on an endocrine level, they've seen it like just on a hormonal level, it shifts men, it boosts testosterone, you know, it, it reduces cortisol, it, it has this massive uh, biological effect on you, because men have been gathering in hunting parties, in in sacred ceremony, in all these things for hundreds and hundreds of 1000s of years. That's what people don't understand. This is ancient stuff. It doesn't take a lot. Men are meant to be together in groups doing things together because it's healthy for them. Mm. What about in terms of like one final message that you might have for men out there who might be listening to this podcast, feeling like they're currently struggling a lot in life? What's maybe like one, you know, bit of advice or, or gu guidance or reference you might suggest to those men listening in? Yeah, I would say like just to what I was speaking to, find a men's group and find find mm -hmm. a men like it doesn't matter if they're whatever type of group that you can find where men are intentionally coming together and there's some level like all the hiking and the surfing and stuff like that. That's good for a, one level of nourishment. But in terms of like if you really want to build brotherhood, because like true bonds come when we do difficult things together that's what builds camaraderie and bonds and that can happen that's why guys that get i work with so many veterans because they go to the military and they're like i don't have brotherhood anymore right like i don't, I don't and this world's fake it doesn't matter right and so they want to get back into that but you have to find a group of men who are willing to be real with you to be honest with you and to build those bonds that is just where it begins everything in your life will improve everything will get better if you do that if there's like I said, that would cure the isolation epidemic and the loneliness epidemic among men, right? Just that alone. And so it's really simple. Just there's fucking men's groups everywhere. It's, it's ubiquitous <laughs> now. It doesn't matter where you live. Like go find good men and do something beyond the typical. Be willing to take the risk in your life to have the conversation or say the thing or share the thing that you wouldn't normally share with your brothers. You will be so surprised how going first will open other men up and you'll actually start to have a relationship that you didn't even know you needed with other men will begin to emerge and it will change your life. It changed my life. It's changed hundreds of lives that I've seen around me. It's brotherhood is the medicine, man. Mm. Well, um, yeah, I mean, Evan, this has been a, an incredible discussion and you know, you've you really inspired me and I'm sure a number of men listening in will, will be able to resonate with your messaging and and your your mission and i really respect what you're doing on a daily basis so if my audience wants to connect with you um where can they find you where can they work with you sure so i got a couple projects uh on socials you can find me everywhere on uh, i am evan meyer it's m-e-y-e-r i am evan meyer um evan meyer dot co that's CO. And then I have a, a company. So I do one-on-one -on -one coaching through that. And then I have a company with three of my best brothers. Uh, it's called 13 Pines. You can go 13pines.com. We've got an online community launching uh, in late or March 1st, 2024. Uh, we've got retreats that we run in the US and, uh, and programs and everything like that too. So if you're looking for good conscious brothers, guys that really want to lead their lives powerfully, relationship, purpose, all the stuff I talked about today, learning the practices, the tools, just to really become a powerful and body conscious man. Uh, 13pines.com is the best place to go for that. Awesome. I'll make sure to leave those linked in the show notes. But uh, otherwise, Evan, great to connect, 